Hello, it's David at DCES UK, and you join me on this fine Sunday morning. That's most curious, most unlike me to be working on a Sunday, but this is for family, so uh, I, uh, I'm duty-bound to get this done. And what am I getting done? It's a consumer unit change from old school to new fuse box. And a quick plug at this point for the fuse box range at consumerunitworld.co.uk who asked me to make this video so it's all their fault that this epic production even exists as I wasn't going to film it originally. A link and discount code are in the description. For consumer units, there's one thing to say. Consumer unit world, the code at UK. For a saving on the fuse box stranger check out time. Use the discount code at save 7109 What's happening? Oh, we were abusing others whose services are fast. Especially if the prices make you pay through the hours. So we have got a great adventure, speedy deliveries. All those more prints and plastic check out T's and C's. <laughs> Bloody hell did that come from? Yeah, I tell you what, uh, Wilex, <laughs> they must have made millions because uh, you, you, even now in the year 2020, we're still finding so many of these BS 3036 boxes. And it doesn't matter how many you pull out over the years, there's still plenty of them around. So uh, yeah, Phew. Wilex must have sucked somebody's schlong to get that contract to. <laughs> pretty much put their boards into every bloody house that was being built around the uh, the 70s and 80s. We've got the original DB1, which would have been uh, the original board put into the property, I imagine. I don't think that's been upgraded since the place was built, although various other things have been shoehorned into it, as we shall see. We then have a BS4293 RCD that's been retrofitted later, and hanging off that is another fuseway there. 30 amp, which is for the shower circuit and something else that we should look at later. And what's happened was, uh, this is a house that my niece and her husband have moved into and they had an electrical translation condition report commissioned, which has failed the property on various things. I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, David, you prick, if you're so shit hot at this game, then why is your own family not using you to undertake condition reports? Well, this is a, a two hour jaunt away from base, which is why I'm here on a Sunday, because I wouldn't ordinarily leave the leafy confines of Warwickshire to go somewhere else. So uh, I came down here yesterday on Saturday and I undertook my own condition report because I didn't trust this paperwork and for good reason, as we shall see. Uh, and the status of the installation is such that uh, although there are things that need doing here i'm happy that i can upgrade to a new rcbo board and it shouldn't ought to trip because of any ir problems or anything like that i've blanked out the details but the contractor who undertook the inspection previously are nic eic uh, ac contractors uh, and which trusted traders, same as me. So shame that they made a bit of a fucking balls up on what they've recorded here. But we'll we'll have a, a little look through that, go through it, see what I like and what I don't like. Let's have a look at the property first, get a bit of a lay of the land so I can show you around. It's a 60s semi-detached, originally three bedrooms, now four, with some 1980s updates. <laughs> Manny son have just moved in only a couple of weeks ago and Looking at the decor, I would suggest that the history of the place is such that the previous owner has probably been in for some years, 40 plus years. Maybe they were the original owners of the house and have lived here all that time, or maybe they moved in later. Certainly someone's been in around the 1980s mark to do this kind of feature work with some Oh, period lighting pieces if you call them such uh, and no one's changed it since and there's evidence of some iffy alterations should we say some alterations that were perhaps not done in the best way so we, we had a, a DIY too these are interesting these beams aren't they uh, I can just see uh, Joe Homebase's wife saying yeah, I'm all right I'd like to have some country cottage features in my semi-detached love and uh, Mr. Homebase himself saying, OK, love, I'll put them in. It'll look like you're in a 15th century inn. And then we'll stick some 80s 
panelling and brickwork by it. This isn't in the West Midlands, incidentally. If indeed that was a West Midlands accent, I can't really do accents. I can only do that one and uh, Northern Irish. And I can only do two words in Northern Irish, which is fuck ye. But uh, that's about as far as my uh, language skills or my impressionist skills extend to. Uh, so yes, yeah, so a lot of panelling and some fake wood beams and that sort of stuff. And these, oh, these oh so tasty candle lights with their drippy wax effect. Mm -hmm. Liking that, especially when you start putting in uh, a modern LED lamp with a plastic base that's got writing on it. Uh, so throughout the house, um, things are dated and that, that sort of indicates that perhaps the installation hasn't been maintained, the electrical installation hasn't been maintained over the years and that any modifications required have been sort of done by the homeowner themselves who has felt that they're a bit handy. Um, perhaps aren't, and my EICR certainly uncovered a few things which raised my monobrow to a certain extent. But let's go and have a look at the source of the installation and have a closer chat about the report as commissioned. Let's interrupt proceedings at this point to look in detail at what this report says and why I had to discount it and re-inspect the property. This EICR cost £125 plus VAT, which is cheap for a property of this size and it led to an outcome deeming the installation to be unsatisfactory with a proposed remedial bill of over £1,200. And that was open-ended as some of the costs were down to fault finding, so it may have led to additional labour and materials. When my niece sent me the report for review, it didn't take my wandering eye too long to spot items of interest. Stupid stuff that you always see, like the British standard of the main switch being incorrect, no limitations being listed despite limitations being present on the test results, miscodings on the schedule of inspections, basically the meat and potato stuff that any inspector worth his or her salt ought not to be tripping up over. No fewer than 22 observations were recorded, although in many cases the observations didn't match the schedule of inspections. But let's have a quick flick through those observations and then we'll have a look at what I found on site. Observation number one, no circuit charts. Fair enough, we can see that these old BS3036 fuse boxes do indeed have no schedules or labelling to indicate what does what. However, the very process of performing an ERCR does create a circuit chart. It's your schedule of test results, so you can always recommend to the homeowner they print that out and place a copy at the source of the installation, or do that yourself as part of the service. I used to do that for people, but now I just leave them to it, if indeed they can be asked. As far as I'm concerned, if I've provided a report or certificate with a complete schedule of test results, then there is a circuit chart relevant to the installation in the possession of the current duty holder. Numbers 2 and 3, no surge or arc fault protection, C3. That's interesting, I've not been C3ing the lack of such on my own inspections. Neither are a specific regulatory requirement for domestic installations at this time, although I guess the Blue Book does recommend them. Maybe I should be coding it on my reports. What are you great unwashed doing out in the world with regard to this? Let me know in the comments. Number four, circuit numbers not labelled on conductors within consumer unit. Regulation 514.5.1 pertains to the identification of individual conductors or groups of conductors, and while it's certainly good practice to have individual wires numbered or identified, especially in a crowded enclosure such as this one where it's difficult to make out each end of the ring circuit or which line goes with which neutral and CPC, it is nonetheless not common for wires to be numbered on domestic installations. A professionally installed consumer unit will be logically laid out with each circuit on an individual protective device and with the earth and neutral bars numbered to match the circuits. We don't have that here as this fuse box is an oversubscribed shit show, so fair enough I guess. Observations 5 to 9 plus 11 and 12 are all about the lack of an RCD for additional protection for all circuits, although there is a 30 milliamp RCD here on at least one circuit. Number 10, JB in garage. They helpfully provided this picture, which looks horrific, but more on that later. Number 13, light in upstairs en suite, not IP rated. Again, we'll look at that later. Number 14, unable to find earth in upstairs lighting circuit to carry out ZS test. Looks like circuit is wired in two core cable. This being a mid to late 1960s property means it was on the cusp of the change from lighting circuits moving from unearthed to earth arrangements. The former existed because light switches and pendants were plastic and were not generally intended to be replaced by anything more decorative such as brass or brushed steel. A change of lighting in any given room 
generally just meant attaching a different shade. At some point, the regulations figured it would be better to have an earth along the run of the cable and to future-proof any changes of accessory. For example, from a basic batten fitting with bare lamp or shade in the kitchen to a class 1 fluorescent, an upgrade I remember my own father making to our house in the 1980s. An upgrade that has indeed also been made to this house, leaving an unearthed metal fitting exposed, something this report fails to pick up on incidentally. It's the wording I find questionable here though. Looks like circuit is wired in two core cable? Yes, indeed it is. Or at least the original lighting circuits are anyway. The later extensions front and rear have earth lighting. If it's been inspected by someone who knows their onions and who recognises the age of the property and at least the light history of their industry, then I'd expect a more definitive statement than one which begins with the words looks like. It most certainly is a two core cable with no CPC. Observation 15, missing earth in single socket next to cupboard where consume unit is. Couldn't carry out ZS test. We'll look at that later too. All these things to look forward to later. I hope you have a stiff drink to hand. Number 16, on circuit 5 of the consume unit there is a broken earth conductor somewhere along the circuit that needs further investigation. It should say CPC rather than earth conductor really, but I'm perhaps being pedantic there. The trouble with this one is that if we look at circuit five on the schedule of test results, it appears to list a socket ring and what it calls a spur. I'm gonna have a long rant about that later, but here today, I have no idea what that CPC break relates to, and I find no evidence of such in my own inspection and testing. He has recorded a limitation in the R2 column, so maybe that was a break end to end on the ring CPC, but then, that wouldn't be a limitation, that would be an open circuit, which on my testers means a figure of over 1,999 ohm would be recorded in that field to show a resistance test has been undertaken and the result was off scale high for my instrument. A limitation, to me, indicates that the test was not performed at all rather than it having been a failure, but as usual no limitations were listed under part 7 of this report. It's also of note that under section 5 of the schedule of inspections, Item 5.7, Presence and Adequacy of Circuit Protective Conductors, is given a tick and not an FI coding, despite the observation stating the circuit needs further investigation. I've whined like a little bitch about this before, but I still don't understand how there are inspectors out there accredited with the likes of NIC, EIC, NAPIT, etc., who don't understand the correlation between the checklist and the observations. One shouldn't indicate all is okay, with the other contradicting it. A competent report is one another Sparky can pick up and be able to tell what was done, what was found and what needs doing. I can't tell from this report where this CPC break is supposed to be and I can't find any evidence by my own testing that this fault even exists. Number 17, high ZS reading on circuit 5 of the consume unit. High reading came from a single socket next to the door in the front bedroom. Ah, troublesome circuit 5 again. Still at least he's identified where that high reading came from although I didn't find such when I was there, and all outlets on a circuit checked out for earth fault loop impedance. Number 18, low insulation resistance on DB2 supply in the garage needs further investigation. Does it indeed, as item 5.3 on the inspection schedule, condition of insulation of live parts has a twatting tick beside it rather than an FI coding. As it turns out, our chap here has managed to get the shower, utility room sockets and the garage circuits mixed up, so goodness knows where he found a low IR reading of 0.6 megaohm, as my testing didn't uncover such. That said, the garage electrics were an omni shambles and I ended up decommissioning the outgoing feed for it, so if it was a bad IR on the day he was there, it's a moot point now. There were more serious issues in the garage he overlooked, and we'll see what they were in a short while. Incidentally, I also question his use of DB2 for the garage. We can see there are two fuse boxes in the house, so surely their designation would be DB1 and DB2, with DB3 being out in the garage? This report, however, lists what is presumably the circuit on DB2 on the schedule for DB1 and omits DB3 in the garage completely, even though it was live and serving circuits on the day. Are there any limitations to explain why the board and final circuits in the garage were wholly omitted from the report? Are there bollocks? Number 19, stick with me, we're nearly there. Junction box in garage, loose off the wall and conductors on show. I have a feeling of deja vu here, this has already been recorded under item 10, but I'll show you what's in the garage shortly. Number 20, large holes in bottom of consumer unit. No argument from me there. 
Number 21, use connections on live conductor on circuit one, high end-to-end -end readings. Circuit one is another ring plus spur fuck nugget, and again, that rant is coming up, people, but we can see here he has a reading of 1.35 ohm in the R1 column against a reading of 0.25 ohm for RN, which he correctly identifies as a probable loose connection on the line wiring. Going back to earlier, and he states a sampling rate of 10% of switches and sockets on this report, he's saying he's had 10% of such accessories off the wall to inspect behind them, yet I found no evidence of any accessory removal at all. I had to break the paint with my knife as I went through, look, taking off nearly all of them to look behind. And the first socket I took off on this circuit, which only covered the extension at the front of the house, well, the line wires just popped out. One quick screwdriver twiddle later, and that line resistance was back in the black. On our own inspections, when we uncover a high ring end-to-end, -end, we increase our sampling on that circuit to examine every accessory we can reasonably get into to check for loose connections, trap sleeving, fractured cores, or insulation impeding the connection. Those things which cause a dicky reading. Usually, we find it, correct it, and don't bother reporting it because it's easy and part of the job as far as I'm concerned. Again, item 5.5 of the checklist, adequacy of cables for current carrying capacity is ticked. Yet this circuit serves the kitchen and a break in the line on a ring configuration means it is no longer adequately protected. One leg of that ring could become overloaded under normal operating conditions. Finally, item 22, cable entries not sealed entering consume unit, fire risk. Fair enough. A quick peek at the schedule of test resorts and as I say, despite there being two separate independent fuse boxes in the house and a newer board in the garage, only one schedule has been provided, while the garage has been wholly omitted. Two main switches are listed, albeit without details to show their rating or BS5419 number, not BSEN60947-3 as given elsewhere on this report, and circuit 8 is shown separately to the other circuits which I imagine suggests it's separate to DB1, although why no circuit 7? Most curious. It's also of note that Circuit 8 had a BS4293 device listed here, which is the RCD enclosure protecting DB2, the overcurrent device for DB2 being a BS3036 fuse. Circuit 6 is listed as a shower, but as I found it actually turned out to be the utility room sockets, probably an old cooker circuit that from before the kitchen was extended, but it's not been identified and no test data exists for it at all here. The circuit hanging off DB2 is for the shower, which explains why an upfront RCD was installed for that. And the garage, as it turned out, comes straight off that RCD with no overcurrent protection at all, save for the supplier's fuse. So the details for circuit 8 here are partially correct in that only an RCD has been identified and no overcurrent protection exists on the garage. Strange then that it isn't mentioned in the observations and that item 5.6 is ticked in the inspections for adequacy of protective devices, type and rating for fault protection. A line to neutral short on the garage supply won't trip this RCD, but might well melt it. Although it is possible to find some BS4293 RCBOs, the device here is just an RCD. Note also the basic errors and omissions on this schedule. Only one R1, R2 result, limitations given but not listed on circuit wave 5, RCD test data where elsewhere the report claims no RCD on all circuits in multiple observations, despite item 4.17 in the checklist bafflingly going on to list it as not even being applicable, a confusing schedule layout which mashes together DB1 and the RCD enclosure but omits DB2 and DB3, Incorrect circuit numbering, which doesn't align with what's on site, and incorrect CPC size recorded for circuits 6 and 8. Well, it's not up to standard, is it? It was cheap, but then if it's not accurate and draws the wrong conclusions, then it's worthless, even if the sodding thing is free. Anyway, this was the paperwork I went in armed with, and after undertaking my own inspection and testing, let's now look at what I found and what the last chap missed before we get on to the ripping out and upgrading. The garage is an interesting proposition. Take a look at this. Yeah, that's not pretty, is it? You know that you're in horrendous DIY territory when you see something like that flapping around, don't you? That's one of those jobs where someone's walloped it in thinking, well, it works, who cares if it's safe or decent or whatever. The interesting thing about this is on the report, they note this, jolly good too. Uh, so good, in fact, that they noted it twice. For some reason, they've put it down on the schedule of inspections under item 10, junction boxing garage C3, improvement recommended. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, but then they've also listed it as item number 19, junction box and garage, loose off the wall and conductors on show, C2. And they sent this picture, which definitely is what we're looking at here. However, there's two things to say about this. First of all, I don't know if this, this the, the inspection was done in back in like January, February. I don't know if this was live back then. It's certainly not live now. If it were live back then, then cut off cables like this with exposed ends or the hole in the back of the box, which certainly was present and potentially exposing live parts. Well, that would be a C1 in anybody's book, wouldn't it? So I don't know why I've listed it as a C3 and a C2. I mean, clearly it's if it's like that, if it was like that, it was like that because it's on the picture. So if that were live back in January, that's a C1. There's no point listing it as a C2, C3. It's a C1 condition. The thing is, though, it's not live. It's dead. And the picture from back in January shows the same thing. It doesn't like someone's come along and cut it off since. So it must have been dead on the day. They must have just looked at that and thought, I ain't touching that, mate. And you can see by the cobwebs on it that no one's been handling it or looking into it any time recently. The light's dead, the switch is dead, the junction box is dead. They're all dead, Dave. Everybody is dead, Dave. But what's interesting as well in the picture is that you can see the corner of this Proteus consumer unit, which most certainly is not dead. That bugger's live. And that's a problem for two reasons on this report. First of all, there's a great big stonking hole in there with a bloody live buzz bar just inside that can be touched. And secondly, why is this board not on the report at all? With the cover off, you can see right, that's the break, second break is not doing anything at all, but... Um, it's certainly live. So a live buzz bar right there, no covers on the board. So my question is, that being the case, why is this board not listed at all on the report? It only lists the circuits that are inside the house. I mean, this is part of the electrical installation. They've paid for an electrical installation condition report. You'd think that it would cover the entire electrical installation. There are certainly no limitations to say we can't be asked to check out the garage, mate. Uh, the board was obviously there and visible on the day. There's, you can see half of it in their own photograph that they've taken. The, there's a socket circuit coming off the board here, which is live. I had my tester on it yesterday. I can confirm that's live. So why wasn't that circuit tested uh, and listed separately to everything else? Why have they listed this as a C2 and a C3 when it's decommissioned, but completely failed this, to notice the C1 condition of there being an exposed live buzz bar right behind that flap? Now, um, I'm going to extricate myself from this bother today by decommissioning the feed to the garage because it's shite. And the new homeowners aren't particularly interested in retaining it. If they want power to the garage, the best bet is to run a new SWA down the garden. We're going to have a look at the, the root of this thing in a minute and where it's sourced from. The feet of the garage snakes around the garden fence. So that ain't clever, is it? Across the top of here and through the wall there. Where on earth is that going? Well, I shall tell you where it's going. It's not written on the old report, but I found it yesterday. It's actually going across the front of the house and into here. Well, that looks like, a, looks like an electrical box, doesn't it? So we can certainly put a flash symbol on it. There's also a fat spider living in there. There he is. Ooh, you can keep that. Uh, but we're just going to the feet of the garage, so anything in the garage is off the books now. Uh, they also noticed on the report that they had a low IR number to the garage, which they said they would have to do some further investigation on. No evidence of that. Our reading's fine, despite the state of the thing. It's just a case that uh, all of the IR may be okay, the, the circuits are crocker nonsense, and it's all been there for a very long time. It's quite decayed, and it's got to go. 
Something else wholly missing off the report. Notice this built-in wardrobe arrangement. Oh yes, but jolly good. Someone's DIY handiwork there. There's a socket down there. There's a socket up there. There's a socket down there. Hmm. There's drunken running up there. Well, let's have a peek behind here, shall we? Because I looked behind here yesterday and found something rather fruity. Single cable. Let's get this box out. Standing with the dry line boxes, I don't know about you, but for me, it's Appleby or nothing. I hate those really cheap ones where you know that builders the your electrics. They'll buy the cheapest dry line box possible and get the ones where as you try and get the screw in, it pushes the bloody lugs in on the side. And you've saved yourself 5p per box and then have to spend ages trying to get the damn thing on. Right, let's have a look in here at the horror within. I've popped my torch in there so you can see what's going on, but over there is obviously the location of where a socket once was. And look at that, professionally made off bit of electrical tape going, wrapping itself around a junction up there and then curiously another one there so that's not very forward thinking is it why why junction once when you can junction twice badly so what's going on there well it, what we have is obviously single cables going off to the other two sockets over that side and also a cable going off up the trunking up there where it feeds into this bad boy. Oh, hello puss. Yes, a two kilowatt bathroom heater. Unfused. And that's the problem here, isn't it? That's what Joe Homebase has failed to take into account. Yes, it works, but it, it's crap. <laughs> and there's no fuse on that bathroom fan heater now you've got a two kilowatt heater sitting without a fuse its only protection is back at the board the 30 amp fuse back at the board so if the heating element of that thing goes short circuit well it's potentially going to overload the wiring before the fuse kicks in if it ever does depending on how short circuit it gets so obviously you know um, that's something that needs to go and again that should have been picked up on the report they should have seen that bathroom heater there and said okay well where's the supply for that and that's what i did and all you have to do is look over the other side of the wall and see this trunking coming down to this position here you pop the socket off to have a look and uh, hey presto a whole new can of worms is opened and it seems to me that few, if any, I don't think any accessories have been taken off during this inspection because I can see that there's still paint around them and wherever I've taken them off, I like to sort of get the knife out and crack the paint. So I don't think it's been very diligently performed and that's why things like this are getting missed. I'm so sick of seeing these iffy inspections. If, you're not, if you can't be asked to do it properly, then get out of the fucking game. What's the point of doing half a job on it? It makes you wonder what else they do half a job on these, these companies, whether their installation work is as half-arsed as their inspection work, whether their testing on these circuits is as half-arsed as their inspection work. But, you know, no one ever seems to get into trouble for it, so I suppose they just make their money and bugger off. The ensuite. What do you think about that? Couple of things. First of all, yet another fan heater. And I've not found the fuse for it, so I don't know where that's fed from. I suspect it's shoehorned straight into something it shouldn't be. But I've had a, a good poke around, and there's no obvious fuse point anywhere serving that. So again, that would have to go down if you were doing a report as being 
potentially dodgy or requiring further investigation or whatever because we don't know whether that's hanging directly off a 30 amp fuse down in the board or whether there is some 13 amp protection as they're supposed to be as the manufacturer would have stipulated in their instructions protecting that thing and if there is a fuse for it well I would argue that it's been put somewhere it shouldn't be probably above that ceiling or something somewhere where they think oh that's all right it'll be fine there it'll never blow no one ever needs to get access to it but it should be more obvious it should be somewhere somewhere obvious somewhere labeled and it isn't jack something else that got missed off the report that shouldn't have been we have a shower isolator for this shower circuit fair enough let's turn it on we should see a light appear on the shower sure enough but What's this I hear? The fan has come on as well. How can that be? Well, tell you what, let's have it off on camera and uh, see what's behind there, shall we? There we have it. What do we have? We have a shit show because you've got here your nice fat cable to service the shower and then you've got your skinny cable coming off to service the fan. Again, it's supposed to be fused out. That fan's supposed to be on a, I imagine, 5 amp fuse maximum according to most manufacturers instructions I see on fans so that ain't very clever is it again if this fan were to suffer a fault where it seized or whatever and drew a current that was too high for the wiring to cope with that fuse downstairs can potentially sit there passing such a fault current all day long and all that's going to happen is that's going to burn. Completely missed off the report that, but again, they, they shouldn't have done because you look at a fan in a room like this and you say, well, where's the point of isolation? Where's the isolator for it? And often there isn't one because it just gets daisy chained from the back of the light fitting, which isn't quite so bad because at least the light fitting's fused at five or six amps. To come off a shower circuit it's just nuts in the balls is what it is it's nuts up the arse whatever kind of nuts it is it's salted roasted and uh, what else can you do with nuts the only thing they did pick up on is the light we have a batten fitting light and they've said the light is not IP rated C3. Yeah, Jesus. You can have a batten light in a bathroom. Let's talk about zones in bathrooms first of all. When we're talking about IP rating the lights, we're talking about or IP rating of any equipment in a bathroom. We're talking about whether it's zoned or not. You've got your uh, zone one bath, shower, tray, etc. Zone 2, above that to a height of 2.25 metres and extending out by, what was it, 60 centimetres or something. And that light is over 75 centimetres away from this partition, this partition itself forming a barrier between that zone and out here. So equipment out here doesn't have to be IP rated if it's above 2.25 meters. The ceiling is a bit low, so I'm gonna let it slide this time because it is about 2.25 meters and it's protruding into the room. But this batten fitting itself is not a problem in a bathroom. And if those who say, oh, it's supposed to be IP rated, well, take a look at the ceiling here. Does that look IP rated to you? And that's much closer to the shower and uh, on a higher current circuit. Same here with this thing here. Quite close to the light, not far away from it, on the wall at a height. No mention, and the fan as well, the electric fan, no mention of any of these 230 volt services also being in the bathroom and being unfit for purpose. Because people look at the fan and they look at the shower isolator and they look at the bathroom heater and they go, yes, but they were made to be in a bathroom. Also, is the fucking light fitting. It, okay, so you've got a naked lamp there. Fair enough. And if you take the lamp out, then you've got access to live parts. Well, that's no different to the pendant light in the bedroom. You take the light bulb out of that, you've got access to live parts. And, you know, if you trying to work on the light while you're wet well what can you do about it the the only thing with lighting in bathrooms is it's supposed to be made for the environment made to cope with the environment it doesn't necessarily have to be ip rated if it's not in a zone but it has to be made for the environment so you wouldn't put a steel light in or it's like a fluorescent light or something like that because it would rust it would corrode 
but we can and have put in non-IP lights in bathrooms before. I even had some asshole once say to my customer, he came in after the fact, said, oh, he's put the wrong kind of lights in, they're illegal, illegal. And the customer was on the phone to me going, well, this guy's saying you put the wrong kind of lights. And I told her that he didn't know what the fuck he was talking about because it was outside of the zones and the light was aluminium and it was going to be just fine. And if he could point out a regulation that had been violated, then I'd happily take it up the arse. But uh, of course he couldn't because he didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. Bat and fitting, you might not like them. You might think that they're terribly suitable. They might not be the best thing for a bathroom, but there's nothing there that I can touch to get a shock of without removing the lamp. And that's the same for any other room in the house that has a bayonet fitting. So there's that, but they've put that as a C3. And like I say, okay, this ceiling is 2.25 meters, so I guess it is kind of protruding into the space, uh, although it's outside of any zone, so it doesn't really matter anyway. So, you know, I'll let it slide. Uh, I was planning to change it while here today, just to clear it off. I've, I've got a light with me, but they're talking about having this all ripped out in the next few months. So I'm not gonna worry too much about the fact that that's infused and that's a basic baton fitting. Uh, and I can't find the fuse for the uh, for the heater either because in hopefully a few weeks it's when we come in here with a crowbar to start pulling it all out. But the point is they've coded something that didn't really arguably need to be coded and they've completely missed two of the much more problematic things here which are appliances incorrectly fused for their location and the, for, the, for the job they're doing. Here's our incoming supply. Supply fuse not sealed. That's interesting, isn't it? Because there doesn't look like there's been any updates here anytime soon, except for the smart meter. So I'm thinking that the smart meter installer has cut the seal to the fuse in order to install the smart meter and then has not resealed it, which is interesting. I'll have a little moan about supply seal fuses in a moment. The tail's going up into DB1. Uh, and DB1 is uh, an old BS3036 board, as we saw earlier. Uh, rather oversubscribed for the job. There's more circuits in there than it was designed to handle, as we shall see. Adjacent to that at some later stage, and again, um, although this board perhaps dates to the original installation of the house, uh, this looks like it was perhaps put on in the 1980s, and what we have here is uh, an RCD to BS4293. Still seems to work, or at least the test button does. And hanging off that is a 30 amp fuse supplying the shower. DB2 actually comes off the incoming tails rather poorly from DB1. It ought to be really a handy block or something there, but we'll have a closer look at that shortly too. Now, some bits of white tape on here because I say I did an EICR on here yesterday and I've been through and traced where all these circuits go, but you can see that. This is not as originally intended or installed, this, this board, because we have more wires going into protective devices than the thing was really made for, and especially on the neutral bar there, it's all a bit crowded. It always, when you see three wires going into what is supposed to be, or you know is supposed to be a ring circuit, it sets alarm bells ringing, two wires going into lighting, well, that's not great, is it? So we've got three circuits, sorry, two circuits on that one, two on that one, two on that one, one, two on that one, one on that one. More circuits than the board was designed to handle. And let's have a chat about a ring circuit here and this 2.5 which is going off to a separate radial circuit and what I don't like about that. Now I have said before, it was only a week ago, I was having a discussion on Twitter with people about this very configuration which is common enough. First of all, Let's get it out of the way. I don't like ring circuits. I've said it before that no, very few other countries in the world use ring circuits. According to Wikipedia, I think Ireland and the United Arab Emirates are the only other country outside the UK to use rings. The idea of a ring circuit is that uh, after the war, when new houses were being built, they would give you one high power socket circuit, a 30 amp circuit that covered the whole house. So all your sockets were on one high power ring circuit, which is fine until you come to dangle your accessories off, in which case you've got this thin cable here and there's no way a 30 amp 
breaker is going to protect if your if your appliance goes short circuit or whatever so fuses went into plugs you get a 13 amp fuse for something like a kettle or a toaster a 3 amp fuse for a light such as what we've got here uh, a 5 amp fuse for some intermediate devices where uh, like um, towel rails or something like that that take more than a 3 amp fuse can cope with but don't need a whole 13 amp uh, and there are various other sizes that are less common but still available nonetheless so the idea was you'd have one ring socket circuit one high current ring socket circuit serving a whole property which is fine until the friggin fuse blows something goes wrong blows the fuse and you lose all your sockets and unless you're a little au fait with having to pull this sucker out and change the fuse wire then uh, unless you happen to have some fuse wire as well then it all got a bit hairy so what they started to do was they started to put in two ring circuits usually one for the ground floor one for the first floor or maybe one for the front half of the house one for the back half of the house which is starting to be a bit of a bit of a nonsense do you really need two 30 amp circuits in a single abode a three bedroom house or whatever probably not but it was handy if you if one if the, one of them failed at least you still had some sockets available you could still plug your freezer into something and, and stop your, your food from defrosting or whatever and unfortunately things move on slowly and not very efficiently and house builders today tend to often put in three ring circuits into a new property so you may get one for the ground floor one for the first floor and one for the kitchen which is all getting to be a bit of a bloody nonsense because what you should should be doing these days really arguably is doing what the rest of the world does and just sticking in some uh, lower current radials 20 amp radial to serve your bedrooms for example uh, another 20 amp radial or 16 amp radial to serve your, your ground floor it's, it's, radials are fine at that sort of current as long as you're not plugging in loads of electric heaters and that sort of thing so i suppose you could argue well what happens if your central heating fails you need to start plugging in a load of uh, electric radiators or whatever it's a nonsense um, so uh, rings are a throwback I don't like them I don't install them myself uh, I'd rather put in a four mil radio and yes I know that's when it comes to derating cables for certain factors then four mil can fall foul of that but I think in most most occasions where you're talking about you your average sort of family home where it's a short cable run uh, I, I think you know you can get away with a four mil 32 amp radial without too much bother some people will disagree with that but i'd rather put in a 4 mil 32 amp radial than a fucking ring because if the ring breaks then you have this immediate issue where there may be an overload fault potentially able to occur that the fuse won't be able to protect you from but you won't know that the ring is broken because all the sockets will still work and indeed uh, today we or yesterday i came across a ring break that the, the previous installer didn't pick up i found where it was as well luckily first time um the, 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 what i don't like about this sort of situation where you've got the three wires going into here is when the th obviously you've got two of them form the ring circuit the third one in my opinion and it is an opinion is an entirely independent radial circuit in its own right. Now our previous inspector has put it down as sockets and spur. So what they're saying is you've got your ring socket circuit and this other wire here is being treated as a spur. If we look in appendix, what is it? I've got my, I actually got my regs but women here. Appendix 15 for ring radials. Um, to me, a spur is a convenient way of adding in an additional socket to the ring circuit without causing major disruption to the fabric of the building. So in your living room here, for example, you want an extra socket by the TV. It's not practical to get a, a whole new cable from the board across the room to serve that socket. It's just going to be an eyesore or be far too much trouble than it's worth or cause damage to final finishes or whatever. However, if there is already a socket there, that's on the ring circuit, and you want to put one adjacent to it, then that is my idea of a spur. You just run a cable from there to the new socket. It serves one single or twin outlet only. It can serve more if you fuse it down to protect the cable, or if you run that cable uh, as a four mil, for example, so, you've got a, so you're not running it in a, a, a cable that's too thin for the protective device to be able to protect in the event that more current is drawn from it. And 
Appendix 15 goes on to talk about Spurs. So I've always said, uh, and this is, I, I must admit it's coming out, it doesn't matter how much you, you think you know this bloody blue book, this regs book, even after years, there's still things that, that catch you out and catch me out. Uh, and such happened last week on Twitter when I was in discussion saying, well, to me, that's not a spur. That doesn't um, meet the requirements of a spur. That's not the, the basic idea of a spur, which is to put a socket locally near another socket to provide that, that point of utilisation there that you ordinarily wouldn't be able to get a cable to practically. Uh, this, in my opinion, is an, a radial in of its own right, uh, and it's going off somewhere. It's got its own uh, earth fault loop impedance, quite separate from the ring. It's got its own uh, insulation resistance properties, quite separate from the ring. And uh, the only commonality is that it happens to share the same overcurrent protective device. However, I'm indebted to Steve Clifton on Twitter, who pointed out that in Appendix 15, if you take a close enough peek at it, it does indeed say an unfused spur may be connected to the origin of the circuit in the distribution board. Oh, jeez. And further to that, take a look on page 89. Well, you've got regulation 433.1.1 that states the rated current or current setting of the protective device does not exceed the lowest of the current carrying capacities of any of the conductors in the circuit. Now, if this weren't a socket circuit and I were to take a 2.5mm cable, connect it onto a 30 amp breaker, run it to a circuit endpoint, that would be a C2 condition. That would be a failure and for any other circuit. You would look at that and go, well, that's not right. That you've, you've, the um, current rating of the overcurrent protective device is higher than the maximum rating of the cable. That's obviously that's not, not what you're supposed to, not what it's supposed to be. And you've got regulation 433.1.1 that says that the rated current of the protective device does not exceed the lowest of the current carrying capacities of any of the conductors of the circuit. It's right there in 433.1.1. But then you look down at the same page to 433.1.204 which says a accessories to BS1363, that's your plug and socket arrangements, may be supplied through a ring final circuit with or without infused spurs protected by a 30 amp or 32 amp device. Now the circuit will be shall be wired with copper conductors with a minimum CSA of 2.5 mil. Such circuits are deemed to meet the requirements of regulation 433.1.1 if the current carrying capacity of the cable is not less than 20 amps and if under the intended conditions of use the load current in any part of the circuit is unlikely to exceed for long periods the current carrying capacity of the cable so on the top of the page you've got 433.1.1 which says make sure your protective device is uh, rated to be lower than the current carrying capacity of the cable and then you've got 433.1.204 which says unless it's a plug and socket arrangement to bs1363 in which case whew, you can chuck that out the window uh, and that's um that further regulation 433.1.204 is backed up in appendix 15 which says the same thing you can connect a, uh, a socket outlet directly to the ocpd using 2.5 mil wire a 30 or 32 amp breaker and that's all okay jack which is a load of shit if you ask me uh, I, I, I've made these videos recently about uh, EICRs and not implying or trying not to apply personal standards to EICRs and going by what the guidance says, what the regs say. Uh, and here's me going around putting a C2 on something like that on previous reports because I'd say, well, that 2.5 mil cable isn't protected by the 30 amp breaker. Uh, it's okay, potentially, if it's just going to a socket outlet right next to the board because it's such a short run, it's not likely to get damaged, you can see what it's doing, etc. But where it's going off to another part of the house, that doesn't sit right with me. That's, uh, and you wouldn't do that with any other circuit. You wouldn't take a, a shower or a water heater or a cooker or whatever and say, well, uh, we've only got uh, a certain CSA of wiring here, but we can put in a, a higher rated fuse, rated higher than what the right wiring can take because, well, it's probably all right, really, and it's uh, the current uh, that the appliance is going to use is, isn't probably not going to exceed that. You wouldn't do it anywhere else. It would be C a C2 for everywhere else. So it's a bit ridiculous that we have this situation that it's not a C2 for a, if it happens to be a socket outlet. And, um, and if, when I do a report, regardless of what you think on whether it's right or wrong, when I do a report, I will treat these as two completely separate circuits. I will detail what the ring is serving 
uh, what the characteristics of that ring circuit are. So you've got your ring end-to-ends, you've got your R1, R2, earth uh, loop impedance path, and you've got your insulation resistances, you've got your uh, measured uh, earth fault loop impedance, etc. I'll put all that down for the ring element coming off here. And then I'll do exactly the same for the radial element, obviously without the ring end-to-end -end part of it. So I'll record what that's doing. I'll record the R1, R2, the insulation resistances, because to me they are two disparate circuits. They share a breaker, but they have each has their own completely separate characteristics. And one may have an IR fault that will trip the RCBO I'm about to install, and the other may not. But I need to know what the characteristics of each of those are. And what our chap here has done, our, our predecessor, is he's only listed the ring. He's put it down as sockets and spur, but only listed the characteristics of the ring. So I've got no detail about what this spur is and what it's doing. He's just looked at that and said, oh, well, there's a, a third wire in there. That's a spur going off somewhere. Well, as it turns out, this spur is actually serving a multitude of sockets over in the dining room. So it's not just one socket that's near the board or anything. It's not just been something that's been put there for convenience, added in after the fact. Someone's built an extension out there and they've put in several socket outlets uh, out in that extension run a single 2.5 back to the board and then shonked it into this 30 amp. So all of a sudden this isn't really a spur and again this is a, a radial circuit serving multiple outlets in its own right, demonstrably a C2 now because it can easily be overloaded that cable. If you've got more than one single or one twin socket outlet you can go in and plug in all sorts of things and overload that cable. So we now have a condition where that cable can be overloaded. Would that be C2? Because that wouldn't even be dangerous in the event of a fault, would it? That would be something that could happen normally. You could just come along and plug stuff in. That wouldn't be a fault condition. That would be just too much demand for the circuit under normal operating conditions. So perhaps that's a C1. Yeah. Either way, it's a crock of shite. So I have recorded, my laptop's gone to sleep again. I have recorded the characteristics of both of those and I should be splitting both of those off in my new board when I put it in. So uh, what we'll have there is the dining room sockets we'll have on a 16 or 20 amp RCBO. The uh, the ring piece, piece of shit, we'll have on a 32 amp. And then they've got exactly the same going on over here next. I've got another one 30 amp. This time it is serving an outlet right by the board just here in fact and again you know on a on an EICR I would have let that slide because I can see well it's just going from there to there it's not exactly very well done but it's done interestingly they failed this socket uh, I think they gave it a C2 because it had no earth now you look at that and you go well that's there and the cable goes up and it's there and I can see it's connected to the earth bar so well, there can't be much to go wrong there, surely. Had the front off, the earth popped out of the back. Why would you even bother putting that on a report? I know some people are like, oh, I just want to report what I can see. Uh, I'm not going to do any, any kind of remedials here, but that's an example of something where you, you plug your tester in and it goes, it says, oh, there's no earth here. Uh, and they've put down on the report, can't take a R1, R2, can't take a ZS at this socket because there's no earth. And then they, they walked out and left it. I would rather pop that off to see why discover that the wire's popped out and just put it back in then go to the trouble of detailing it on the report and leaving it for the homeowner to carry on using without an earth. It just seems nuts to me. And there was another one as well, ring brake. And again, I don't think any of the accessories have been taken off during this inspection because they've all got paint around them that I've had to sort of crack off with my knife as I've gone around. Ring brake on this circuit, which they reported it, they actually reckon they got a reading of 1.35 ohms. I got open circuit when I read it on R1. So again, you know, that's a, if you've got a, a break on your line on a ring circuit, then there's the risk that that circuit could become overloaded under normal operating conditions. They've gone to the effort of reporting that, but this circuit only serves a handful of sockets. And the first one I pulled off, out popped the line wires, put them back in, tightened it up, back in business with a, a proper number. So uh, it, it just seems like they, they didn't bother looking behind anything. They found that there was stuff wrong. But you, you, part of the 
inspection process is you peer behind accessories to see how they're installed and, and what kind of issues are there and they seem to have just just not and again you know it's someone's paying for this report to be undertaken uh, and although they're it's, it's not it's not a complete write-off there are, there's some diligence to this what seems to have happened is the, the person undertaking the report seems to be I've had a look at the company it seems to be a lackey who perhaps isn't trained on testing and inspecting uh, and they've gone then back to base presented their report to their qualified supervisor who has then just signed it off blindly but their qualified supervisor should have looked at this and alarm bells should have been ringing for this is a very boring monologue I know I should get on with some work in a minute it's midday as well I need to be getting on with it lights is another one and no earthing on lighting with the exception of the extension at the front because the front's been extended so we got uh, that was I think perhaps done in the 80s uh, and that's earthed but the lighting elsewhere isn't which isn't a problem for the most part because it's all pendant fittings with the exception of a class one fluorescent fitting in the kitchen no mention of that on this report at all but I've had it open you can see that there's no earth wire to it it's a class one luminaire unearthed and what they've said and it's, it's the way they've written it they've said it appears that the lighting's been wired in a two core cable which kind of makes you think that someone's gone around with some flex and did it yeah it is a two core cable uh, but they sh surely they've seen a 60s property without cpc in the in the lighting wiring before and it seems to have taken them a bit by surprise here they don't seem to have quite clocked what they're looking at um, and they certainly haven't spotted that that lighting circuit serves one metal fitting in the kitchen which lack, now lacks an earth mm, yeah so this is our unearthed kitchen light you see now why wasn't that picked up on the inspection you got one here on a different circuit class one fluorescent fitting earth one there class one fluorescent fitting not earth again seems to me like no covers have been pulled off during this process oh tell you what Let's get rid of that. A load of old tosh, we want them hiring people that they shouldn't be. They've also, one of, get near the end of what I don't like about this now, but one other thing, they've, they seem to have misidentified some stuff here as well because they've got shower circuits being this. Well, that's utility room sockets. I mean, it's a six mil cable, so you know I can understand them thinking it's a shower circuit. I think it was originally a cooker circuit because it goes to a cooker switch out there. And I think things have been jigged around probably when they had the extension done and that, that cooker position is now serving a socket outlet in what is now a utility room. But they've got it down a shower. Well, that's the shower. So they've misidentified these circuits as well. They they've, haven't spotted that. That's a socket circuit there. So whatever readings they've got here, I don't know where, what that relates to because they must have put a... In fact, they, they, they haven't put a loop on because there's no R1, R2 on here. So that's if, if you if you put a loop on at this end and take a dead test R1 R2 reading for your earth fault loop impedance, that that confirms what circuit you're on because either you'll get a reading on your tester or you won't. But you've neglected to do that. I've got all these blanks here, and there shouldn't be blanks here. They should put not applicable or put a dash in it or put something in it to make it look like it's not just been omitted. Same with the garage. No R1 R2 down there. They've actually got an IR fault reported for the garage. Now I didn't find any IR faults yesterday. Some low numbers, nothing nothing to raise alarm bells, but it's a moot point because I'll be disconnecting the garage anyway. Let's discuss the plan of what I'm gonna do and then get on with it. <coughs> First of all, no isolator. Now, I've mentioned in previous videos that where I've got an installation without an isolator in the Midlands, I use haste to come out and fit one. So my thanks to Simon Parry on Twitter, who back in June was kind enough to report that haste are no longer offering such a service. Oh boy. Now, last time I checked, um, the last price listing haste had for fitting an isolator was £82.20. That's very reasonable, very reasonable. I'm surprised they even offered it down to that cheap price. 
because it couldn't have been really much worth their time going around putting isolators in at that sort of price. But if you're doing undertaking a board change and you don't want to have your wrist slapped by NIC for pulling supplier fuses or by anybody else, as I have been in the past, then you get haste out for that very reasonable price. They come and fit an isolator. You come along after the fact. You can do your board change nice and safe. Because I've moaned before about why can I not isolate this installation for my safety to work on this equipment or for the customer's safety if ever they need to isolate it. So I checked and yes, hastes are no longer permitted to undertake that work, which is interesting because there was a YouTube comment uh, on one of my videos over a year ago where someone said they worked for a DNO and hastes should not be undertaking that work. They are going out of their bounds by, by doing that. And I argued to toss them saying, well, what the fuck are you moaning about? What's it to you? Because if it makes things safer for me and it's a cheap price for the end client, then surely that's a good thing. But no, DNOs, moaning bitches that they are oh we can't have haste doing this work for us so they have disallowed haste to be doing that anymore and i've had a chat with western power distribution a nice chap at western power distribution who said the problem was that uh, western power can direct haste to do that work they don't want end clients like like me asking haste to do it for them because it's their equipment it's not for haste to be undertaking that work on the authority of someone someone like me or a homeowner it they should only be undertaking it on the authority of western power so if you want an isolator installed now you can phone western power distribution in the midlands and instead of it costing 82 pounds 20 it will cost you 218 pounds so <laughs> if i've got to do a cu change and I want to quite reasonably be able to safely isolate that installation for my safety while I undertake that work. I've now got to say to the client, well, you've got to pony up another 218 quid on top of all my work in order to, to have that done. You know what? They're going to tell me to pack up and piss off and they're going to use the next guy down the road who's just going to come along, cut the seals and pull this fuse. And I've had plenty of people commenting on this channel saying, oh, let me pussy, David, just pull the fuse, you nonce. Yeah, that's fine, except, uh, again, the guy at Western Power is saying, we don't want you pulling supplier fuses. If, we, if you cut seals and pull fuses, we could have you for it. And there's two things to bear in mind here. These smart meters, they'll grass you up. Uh, if you cut the seal there in order to change the tails, then there's an anti-tamper thing there where you take that off. That will report that it's been opened. Similarly, if you pull the fuse and this loses power, and there's been no network outages that the DNO is aware of, then they may well send an engineer around to catch you in the act. So Western Power tell me. And I said to them, well, what, what are you going to do about that then? And they'll say, well, we'll give you a, a warning. I don't know how stern that warning is. No one's ever come to, um, to slap my wrist. I don't do many board changes. We only do a handful a year, though, so I've not had to pull any supplier fuses for a long time because I've always used, well, I've used haste for the past sort of three years or so to, to do my... Um, my isolators for me uh, and it fucks me off because it puts us in a dodgy position doesn't it whereby on the one hand I, I'm told I've got to make things safe for me to work on which I, I would rather do I'm quite happy to kill the power to this so I can work on it without dying uh, on the other hand if I do that then I, I've either got to arrange for a, a horrendous cost from the homeowner or I risk uh, a ticking off or a fine or something for tampering with equipment I shouldn't be tampering with uh, and it's an absolute bag of fucking nonsense because this fucking thing has an engineer menu on it and a contactor position you can actually turn it off from in here but it's protected by a pin code to stop the likes of me from doing it why? why do you not want me to turn the power off to this stuff? Similarly, uh, you know, wh why is the whole of the bottom of this thing sealed? Seal the incoming side, leave the outgoing side open so that I can change tails. What I'm going to have to do here, because these tails I'm going to have to change out, but rather, I, I, rather than cut this and change the whole thing out, which would make the most sense, I'm now going to have to install a handy block. I'm going to have to pull the fuse install a handy block and take my new tails off there which this is an in intermediate junction that doesn't need to be there but i'm forced to do it because i don't want to cut that seal 
And I'm going, you know, I'm going to stick that on that board there as well, and that'd be pretty. Oh, you can't put that on that board. That's DNA property. Oh, fuck you. Fuck's sake, making my life difficult. All I want to do is to turn the power off to this equipment, which is nothing to do with you. It's not your equipment. These aren't your tails. If there's a fault with any of that, you, Western Power or whoever, they're not interested. They're just going to get an electrician. It's nothing to do with us. And yet, if I come along and want to make this safe to work on, then oh, you can't do that because we've got to turn the power off for you. And the guy at, at Western Power said, well, we can send someone out to do a fuse pull. Yeah, really? We're going to try and arrange that to happen, are we? Uh, uh, even then, you know, charges levied. It's just nonsense. And you speak to the Western Power engineers on the ground, they're just like, oh, just put the fuse, mate. But there's a risk today that I'm going to pull this, and <laughs> I, you never know, you might get someone from the DNO knocking on the door going, well, we've detected that your smart meter has lost power. I don't know how clever they really are. Uh, and we want to know what you're up to, and I'll be like, well, I'm what I'm up to is my elbows in this fucking CU change and I'm quite rightly isolating the installation so that I can do it because you haven't given me a switch on this piece of shit to do it you haven't given me the pin code for this piece of shit to do it even though it's capable of doing it you haven't put any kind of isolation on here or in the head to allow me to do it and you know you've got this monopoly of wanting to charge 218 quid to come out and put a switch in place which really I should have the right, or well, the customer should have the right to be there in the first place. And of course they are putting them on new builds. But the trouble is, new builds aren't having the CUs changed out, it's all the old ones. So I think it's all a bit of a nonsense, and I know it's been a long-winded rant, but it gets right on my fucking tits. So if you'll excuse me, I'm going to get PPE'd up, I'm going to pull this sucker out, and when I've pulled it out, I'm going to take the fuse out of it, so I've got an empty carrier, and then I'm going to push that carrier back in, so that there's no live parts exposed, because if I'm trimming cables and stuff in here, I don't want to touch anything to accidentally touch that. And then later on, I'll have to get PPE'd up again and um, put that back into place again. But it's it's all just a pain in the arse. Anyway, I think that's that's it for ranting now. It's time I actually get on with pulling all this out. Have a closer look at those terminals on DB1, and you can see how shonkily DB2 connects into them. It's just been sort of shoehorned in there. Yeah, that was never a great installation, was it? So we'll be taking all that out shortly. Um, I won't film all that coming out. But suffice to say that it shall. And I should have enough space in there to fit this bad boy, which is a CP fuse box board. Like in the fuse box range. Now, obviously, we're putting one in with uh, surge protection. Incidentally, um, this is uh, from consumerunitworld.co.uk, and I can offer you lucky buggers a discount code should you want to order fuse box kit from there. The discount code being SAV7109 for 10% off. So, that's uh, some goodness for you there. For consumer units, there's one thing to say. No, nope, no, nope, we've had enough of that. And I noticed on this one that we now have a B32 breaker on the SPD. Didn't used to, because the it used to be the case that the on the fuse box boards, like some others, the uh, wire came directly off the live terminal of the main switch into the SPD. So why the change? Well, I don't know for sure. But I think it's perhaps to do with regulation 534.4.8, uh, which you may recall from my SPD video last year, where I made the mistake of counting the overcurrent protection being too long. When it comes to SPDs, the distance of the wiring needs to be below one meter, preferably below half a meter. So you've got your line wire from your overcurrent protected device going in to the SPD here, and you've got your earth coming out the bottom going into the earth bar. Uh, so that's supposed to be less than half a meter. And if you look at in the regs book at the likes of 534.4.8, it shows this cable, this wire, coming from the overcurrent protective device. Now, if that's a breaker in the main board here, well, that's that's a no-brainer. That's quite fine. But if it's the main fuse, well, that could be some meters away. And I was always counting it from the point of connection inside the board here. But of course, uh, that does not really what 534.4.8 says. So I don't know if that's because of that regulation that they've changed it so that it now comes off an overcurrent protector device rather than coming off the main switch or if there's some other reason why they've done that. 
Uh, it was probably never a great idea to rely on the main switch because if one of these fails it can fail short circuit and there's a little solder connection in here which is supposed to overheat and break the connection but you're still relying on that main fuse being your your primary means of overcurrent protection which probably isn't a great idea when you can shoehorn a breaker in so they've started fitting them a standard though but uh, I acknowledge Jonathan at JP Electrical for sending me some correspondence from CP Fusebox themselves where they say that's what they're doing with them now but there's no need to retrofit breakers to older boards if you already put boards in where the air prote current protection isn't coming from a breaker for the o for the um, SPD you don't have to go back and fit such that's just my take on it anyway that uh, it may be down to regulation 534.4.8 I don't actually know for sure but it makes sense to me anyway um, I'm going to be populating this with the new small form factor fuse box RCBOs a lovely thing to double pole that's proper double pole so when you switch it off you're isolating both poles uh, small form factor very nice I noticed fuse box now also doing their own proprietary blanks rather than just sticking some blanks in on the front of the board there you get the ones that actually sit on the din rail so that's nice uh, and I'll be populating this box and fitting it into there so let's get all this gubbins out first the old boards out we can see that I think this is the original probably the original house wiring coming out here where the original board position is and all this stuff spewing out here it's probably related to the various extensions. The rear has been extended, the side has been extended. I think all this is newer, probably 80s wiring that has been brought in after the fact. So these are the, the imposters, if you like, that were taking up additional space in the original board. It all been shoehorned in <coughs> rather dodgily. We've got a great big hole in the wall here as well, as it turns out. So that's interesting. But I think, because um, I'm not doing anything with this garage circuit, the only thing I've got to worry about is the shower circuit here extending that. I noticed that now I've got behind it. It's had a few nibbles out of it. I don't know how well you can see that. Let's see if we can zoom and de zoom in. Something's been chewing away on that, haven't they? So I'll have to cut that back to good to sort out. And I'm thinking that if we get this in here, we should be able to work with the older circuits on there, bring the new ones in over on the right, tails gland in at the bottom. Super duper. The only thing I've got to do is obviously I've got this twatting knockout on the back of this thing here and some crenellated grommet strip which was horrendously expensive from CEF and the wrong size. This is the one millimetre stuff. Don't buy the one millimetre stuff. It's about 20 quid this bloody thing. And it just doesn't quite fit on. It's still fighting the fight to get a grommet strip that works and really does the business. It would take me years to get through this. I don't do many consumer unit changes, as I think I may have said earlier. I do only a handful a year, and so I think the third is in about the last two weeks, which is unusual. But it's one of those things, isn't it? Like buses, you wait for ages, then three come along together. I don't know why we don't do loads of consumer unit changes. They're just not, they're just not much fun, are they? You, I was doing one on Thursday, cramped into this little cupboard space, and my back was killing me by the end of the day. And this isn't much fun either, like down on your knees, sort of working in a confined space like this. Anyway, all those are going to come in the back there. That's going to be flush against the wall. There ought to be enough space to open the lid, but I better check that I'm not fouling the lid on anything. I've got a knockout here I can use to bring those cables in on the right, uh, and then I'll, I'll gunk the rest up with some fire sealant. Where's my tails gland? I'll find it in a minute. And then I'm going to put some flexi tails in here to, to get, get this down to where it needs to be. Two types of tails gland for this board. 32 mm knockout, there's this, these whisker ones which work really well with the fuse box boards because they, they'll clip in and stay And I find if I drill a 32 mm hole with my hole saw for these things, they just drop out. So that's a bit weird. So, uh, But these seem to be sized really well the tails gland and that, that gives a nice low profile gland otherwise you've got the, the sort here with the lock nut which would be my usual preferred choice trouble is I stand a little proud I think it's probably going to foul the wooden board always important when putting one of these things on the wall to make sure the lid goes on and doesn't foul anything yes I think that's all right be surprised at how many you see where 
someone goes to the effort of putting it on then realizes that they've done it um, too close to something so the, the lid won't go over the the corner or when they put it on they, they can't actually open the thing because something else is in the way and the bodge jobs i've seen on site for people to get around that sometimes which may or may not include things like gaffer tape to hold it all together it's rather ridiculous anyway we're on that bloody strips coming off it already look damnable stuff I need to find something with bigger teeth so those cables are in these cables obviously normally you, you you set your protective devices in the order of highest to lowest or at least that's the convention there's absolutely no reason that you need to do that of course it's all coming off the same 100 amp bloody buzz bar or 60 amp buzz, buzz bar whatever it is it's just convention uh, here i may choose to def defy convention a little bit just because oh no, i don't think i need to i was thinking not all these wires might reach where they need to go but they will won't they so i, I, I will follow the convention jolly good <coughs> so the next part of the mechanics is to get the tails and earthing in place into here Whew, has the tails and main earthing in always a fight that mechanical part it's the least i part i least enjoy uh, we're going through the, the grommet stripper on this thing i must admit it's the first fuse box board where there's been the tail clamp the previous ones i've bought haven't had that in so um maybe that's something i've just started doing can't see i'm a huge fan of it i have to admit it was a bit of a fight to get get them through there flexi tails are your friend though and they're certainly a lot easier to manipulate than standard tails anyway that's the worst part of it the board getting on the tails and earthing getting into position uh, we're now onto the final circuits this is the bit uh, where we're, we're down to some electrical work as opposed to mechanical struggling to get these elements into place so now i can start sticking rcbo's in and one by one recommissioning these circuits so i'll have to fire up my laptop to remind myself which one's what and we shall start getting these uh, live and online it's a monday morning yes indeed and it's a uh, job jobbed well actually the job got jobbed last night took about four and a half hours or so to do the mechanical work in here admittedly that was with some waffling to camera so uh, it would have been a bit quicker if i didn't uh, hadn't got the camera out a couple of times to talk about this boring subject in such a boring way but uh what we have here it's not as neat as uh, a, lot of, a lot of people do you um, i see some a couple of mincers on some other youtube channel can't remember which one it was where they uh, they do some very neat board changes i'm always of the opinion that uh, these things take long enough and uh, being curled down in a cupboard like this is uncomfortable enough without taking too much time on the artwork of the thing i think that uh, with this sort of arrangement the next person pulling the cover off the consumer unit shouldn't let out an audible gasp either that it looks like a load of spaghetti has been thrown at it or that it looks like a work of art and you know as long as things are laid out logically enough uh, it doesn't really matter if it's not uh, super neat and super lovely and super wonderful inside so well uh, some people would uh, disagree with that perhaps so certainly uh, i don't think it's a good idea to be cable tying any uh, wire cores within a consumer unit uh, just for the sake of aesthetics for it to look neat because then you're cocking up with your grouping factors you're affecting uh, how it works electrically they there needs to be free air around the wire cores sparky mindra i believe did a good video on that some time ago so go check that check that out uh, but we're all in place we've got two spare ways so there's a bit of room there for future expansion lovely board been uh, good to work on uh, i do like the cp fuse box boards as i say i'm not paid to say that uh, fuse box have never given me any financial incentive to say that uh, but i fitted a lot of these and they, they do work rather well like i said this is the first one where there's been a, a tails clamp included the previous ones didn't have that and uh, one way is now lost for the spd so if you buy uh, a 14 way board you're going to have 13 ways to play with because one way is now lost for the uh, overprotective device for the spd uh, obviously i wasn't happy that uh, i had to yank the fuse and the smart meter will have recorded that it's been tampered with of course we'll have to see what comes of that if anything i must admit i have done it before uh, and the things happened in the past but that's not to say that nothing ever will uh, no doubt this thing has grasped me up and someone from the the dno may choose to come knocking on the door and it's going to be 
my sticker on the front of the board, which gives the game away that it was me who did it. And of course, I'm, I'm going to take responsibility for that. I'm not going to leave it the homeowner to to take anything for it. So, uh, you know, I hope that that doesn't happen, and I hope that they're reasonable about it. And it's I because I, I think it's unreasonable that I'm put in this position as I've already moaned about because getting the DNO out to to perform fuse pause or isolator in stores is either horrendously complicated or horrendously expensive and the nice chap at Western Power said oh you can get your supplier to do it for you as well you know I had a customer once who I, I put the I put that onto him I said look get your supplier to come out and fit a, an isolator and he reported back to me that uh, it was such hassle that eventually it cost him more in premium rate phone charges to get through to the right person in, at his supplier to get the job booked and done than it did for them to come and do the job and that's the problem isn't it there's no quick easy low cost effective way of getting something like this safely isolated which is nuts because everything coming out of this meter here is not dna property and i should have the option to to make it dead without having to pay through the nose for it or to have a lot of trouble arranging for someone to be on site and not being the homeowner it's difficult for me to do that sometimes because if I've, I can't exactly phone up the supplier on behalf of the customer and say I want you to come and do this job they're going to say well who are you we're not going to act on your authority we need to speak to the customer ourselves and I don't want to go back to my customer and put that that arsehole upon them <sighs> shit situation but there it is and that's happening all the time of course and who knows how many prosecutions or telling offs there are for it anyway uh, we're in and on and uh, of course with the the final part of the installation as I've re-energized all these circuits is go around performing a functional test and getting a ZE reading from all points to make sure that yes there is uh, functional earthing here it is working as it should be there the numbers do, do still match up so there, there was that body of testing work upon completion of this yesterday to undertake as well and everything's passed everything's done the layout is such that it's uh, logical as opposed to being from highest demand to lowest as you would often see and that's because I've got a bunch of circuits coming from the right which may as well go into the breakers on the right and a bunch coming in the left which may as well go into the RCBOs rather from the left rather than trying to it would look more spaghetti like if I were to try and arrange them in in size order but it doesn't matter it's the buzz bar is the buzz bar it'll deliver the same voltage and current carrying capacity to all circuits so I'm just going to bung the cover back on here now and we're done. Obviously uh, I could have just finished this off and signed this off last night. We got to about five o'clock or so. We had a, a table booked at, a, at the pub <laughs> for 5.45. So I had to rush off, have a shower and then down several pints of lagery pish. Which is why uh, I thought I'll leave coming back here till, till today to do the final the final wrap up and customer handover. Which is what I'm about to do. And there we go. Uh, another successful board change that's the old garage circuit dangling there doing nothing which goes to the spider house outside i'm gonna so that can go i'm not going to take that off myself but that, that's that can be decommissioned anytime in the future as can any of the electrics going out to and within the garage and all that can be redone properly when the time comes uh, in the end I only had to extend one circuit, the shower circuit, which is in a Vargo box there. I had to trim that back to past the, the rodent damage to good cable. And then that's been brought through uh, the side here. We've got um, grommet on the side, we've got the edging strip on the back for the cable entry. And there's this socket here which is going through a grommet on the bottom of the board. So the board is all nice and sealed. Good looking bit of kit. Ought to provide decades of future operation. I think that's a wrap.